All right, well, a couple of questions uh, to uh, warm up your minds this morning. You know, sleepiness is uh, abounding. So, question, and I think Mr. Raleigh will appreciate this. How many of you are so gifted? Right now, a lot of you are like, yes, I am so gifted. <laughs> How many of you are so gifted in music that you no longer need to practice? Anybody? Uh, <laughs> all right, we are taking names. If you wrote your, raised your hand, uh, we will talk to you later. All right, I is there any, any musician that ever reaches a level where they are so talented, so gifted, so honed in their craft that they no longer need to practice? From then on, they are good to go. Is it, does that... Help me out here. Is that, is that true or not? Yes. Alright, that's, that's not true. So today, all of you will what? At least? At least? Two hours. Alright. Amen. We got an amen. Alright. Well, we're in the middle of a journey uh, talking about what it means to be a God seeker, to seek after the God of the universe, the God who created us and made us and fashioned us in His likeness, made us after His image, and not only that, but who, when we rebelled against Him, came to us to redeem and rescue and to restore us and to give us relationship with Himself. And so we began this journey by, by thinking about the relationship that, that God offers to us through Jesus Christ and that He sought us when we were far from Him. And He invited us to know Him. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, that this is eternal life, right? That they may know you, the one true God. He was praying to His Father and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And we talked yesterday about and what it means to seek God's presence, and particularly in the area of our weaknesses. And today we're going to look at what I would consider is an essential ingredient, right? An essential ingredient in the life of a God seeker. Now, how many of you like to, to bake? Anybody? All right. All right. Several of you guys. All right. How many of you have ever uh, baked something and then realized that you left out an, an ingredient? All right. And did it... Uh, wow. Just, I think that's everyone. Um, <laughs> did it change the outcome? Yes. All right. Now, if you're cooking, a lot of times, you, you know, sort of you can get away with skipping an ingredient. But in baking, there, there are certain essential ingredients. That if you leave them out, it just isn't going to turn out the same. And I think much in the same way, the, the ingredient that we're going to talk about today, this thing that is necessary in our lives for us to be a God seeker, is something that, that we cannot do without. And it's also something that we never outgrow our need of. And so just as you never outgrow your need of practice, right? No one does. This is also something that we never outgrow our need for. And yet, it's something that sometimes is often missing in our lives. And that thing is humility. 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 Humility is an essential element in the life of a God seeker. And as we look at God's Word over and over again, we see stories about the dangers and the downfalls of pride. And one of the things that I love about the Bible is that, that it doesn't God didn't choose to whitewash people's stories. Does that make sense? He didn't tend to edit things out that were, we would say, are embarrassing or we didn't want people to know. He, he allowed those stories to be recorded for us. And God says one of those reasons is for our learning, right? That we might learn. And so this morning we're going to look at the story of a man who, who, who struggled, uh, who was wildly successful, but whom succumbed to to pride. And I, I hope that from his life and his story and his example that we might take truth for our own lives that would help us. So if you have your Bible, uh, in just a couple minutes we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles 26. And, and, and while you're, you're turning there, you know, I, I think about the fact that in order for us to have a relationship with God, right, we had to come to a place of humility, right? We had to come to a place where we humbled ourselves before God, where we admitted our need of Him. We, we acknowledged our sin and, and our rebellion against Him. We, we believe that, that Jesus came and, and He died for us, that He was raised to life for us, and that He reigns at the right hand of the Father, and that He's coming again. And we've, we've bowed our life before Him in humility, and, and we've asked Him to be our Savior and our Lord and our Master and our friend. And we would hope or think that from that moment on, right, that we would never again struggle with pride. 
What, would, would you agree with me? Like, I mean, it just, it seems like, like that if we come to such an awareness of God's grace and His mercy and His salvation, that, that from that moment on that we should just live lives of humility before God. But what I've noticed in my own life and the lives of others is that's not always the case. And pride is, pride is a very sneaky thing. Do you ever notice that? Right? Pride doesn't just rush in all at once. It, it creeps, it sneaks, it lurks in the shadows, it wiggles its way into our lives and it overtakes territory in our hearts. And sometimes we are completely unaware that it's even happened. We're completely unaware that it's there. And we don't even realize that humility is missing. And really when we think about it, pride is the root cause of all rebellion against God. Right? Because ultimately pride is an exalting of self over God. Pride is an exalting of self over God. It's thinking too much of you and too little of God. And it pushes God's presence out of our life. Right? Not, not if we have a relationship with Him, it does not push God out of our life, but it pushes an awareness of His presence. Psalm 10 verse 4, just, just listen, don't, don't turn there, we're going to jump into first, or Second Chronicles, but Psalm 10 4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him does not see God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Pride pushes God's presence. We're going to look at a man today whose name was Uzziah. All right, how many of you have heard of King Uzziah? Anybody? All right. Most of you, some of you. For, for others, this will be a new story. He was a king of Israel. And I just want us to, to read through his story. So let's look at 2 Chronicles 26, and we're going to read through verses 1 through 15 together. It says, All of the people of Judah had crowned Amaziah's Catch this, 16-year-old son, Uzziah, as king in his father's place. I just want to stop there. If you're 16, would you stand up? Just, if you're 16, all right. Can you imagine being king or queen? All right. All right. How many of you would, uh, yeah, all right, you can sit down. That's, we'll get back to that, but that's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? All right. We're not even talking like president. We're talking about king, queen, ruling. After, Uzziah, after his father's death, Uzziah, this is verse 2, rebuilt the town of Alath and restored it to Judah. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. His mother, Yechaliah from Jerusalem, and, was, and Uzziah, verse 6, declared war on the Philistines. And he broke down the walls of Gath and, and Gadna and Ashdod. And then he built new towns in Ashdod area and other parts of Philistia. Verse 7, God helped him in his wars against the Philistines, in his battles with the Arabs of Gur, and his wars with the Meunites. And the Meunites paid annual tribute to him, and his fame spread even to Egypt, for he had become very powerful. Uzziah built fortified towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the angle wall, in the wall. He also constructed forts in the wilderness and dug many cisterns because he kept great herds of livestock in the foothills of Judah and on the plains. He was also a man who loved the soil for he had many workers who cared for his farms and vineyards both on the hillsides and in the fertile valleys. Uzziah had an army of well-trained warriors ready to march into battle unit by unit. This army had been mustered and organized by Jael and the secretary of the army and his assistant Masaiah. And they were under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's officials. And these regiments of mighty warriors were commanded by 2,600 clan leaders. The army consisted of 307,500 men, all elite troops. And they were prepared to assist the king against any enemy. And Uzziah provided the entire army with shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and sling stones. And he built structures on the walls of Jerusalem designed by experts to protect those who shot arrows and hurled large stones from the towers and the corners of the wall. His fame spread far and wide, for the Lord gave him marvelous help, and he became very powerful. All right, so we've, we've, we've been painting the picture of this man who becomes king of Israel at, at 16 years old. And the picture that we're painted is, is a young man who takes on that leadership. And we would say that he is wildly successful. His accomplishments are, are, are amazing. He rebuilds a city, Allah, that was key to commerce and trade and economic prosperity. He had powerful and key military victories. He organized armies like never before. He invented new war machines. Right? He invented new, new strategies of war. He fortified cities. He was a great agriculturalist. He dug wells. 
He was powerful, he was brilliant, he was diverse, and he was influential. And so we might want to step back and say, what, what was his secret? What made him this way? What gave him success? Well, look back. Look at verses 4 and 5 there in 2 Chronicles 26. Let's, I'm going to zone in on these verses. It says, it says that he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. L look at verse 5. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord... God gave him success. And literally, that, that phrase there, God gave him success, literally means that God pushed him along. And so, Uzziah was a seeker of God. Right? Uzziah was seeking God. He was influenced by a godly man named Zechariah, right, who encouraged him. Look, it says, look what it says there in verse 5. It says that he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And so this man, Zechariah, likely an older mentor, like somebody who comes alongside the 16-year-old king, right, and gives him guidance and wisdom. And, and he, this man, Zechariah, taught Uzziah to fear God, to, to have a reverence for God, to have an awe of God. And as such, Uzziah was a man who then sought after God, and God helped him. Verse 7, that word help there, it literally means that he surrounded him. And so the reasons for Uzziah's success are very clear. He sought God, and God blessed him, and God prospered him. God pushed him ahead. That word for sought there literally means to tread or to frequent. Right? And so Uzziah was a man who came before the presence of God, who sought God and his ways and his wisdom. He sought his approval. And so Uzziah is a God seeker. And he's very, very successful, very powerful. And I think probably early on, he was driven by an awareness of how much he needed God. Can you imagine being king at 16? Right? Some of you are like, yes, I could, right? I could imagine being queen. I could imagine being king. In fact, I, I could do this, right? But I would imagine that just shortly into your reign as king or queen, you would realize what? I'm way over my head. Right? I, I, I need help. And I think Uzziah knew that he needed God. He knew that he needed God's strength. He knew that he needed God's wisdom. And not just that, but he wanted God's approval on his life. Right? His blessing, his hand. He wanted to please God. I, I, I think of, of the fact that he may have been influenced by David and his legacy and, and the Psalms that he wrote. In Psalm 19, verse 14, says this, David said, May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so Uzziah sought God and his fame spread. Look at verse 15. Second half of verse 15, it says that his fame spread far and wide for the Lord gave him marvelous help and he became very powerful. And so the text is very clear that Uzziah's success came from God. That God's blessing, God's hand was on his life and, and that he was marvelously helped, it said. Powerfully helped by God. And so this is, a, this is an amazing story. Right? I mean, really, 16-year-old king who becomes so successful and so powerful, so well-known, so influential, and in a good way, in a God-honoring way, right? Not, not somebody who was trying to grab power for himself or, or, or do things to exalt himself, but he was a God-seeker. But somewhere along the line, something happened. And, you know, success is one of the greatest tests of our character. Success will be one of the greatest tests of your character in life. And it's going to be Uzziah's downfall. The blessings of God are actually going to become his downfall. And pride is going to sneak into his life. Look at verse 16. It says, But when he became powerful, he also became proud. Remember early on, Zechariah is pouring into his life and, and he's seeking after God. Right? He's seeking his presence and his approval. He's seeking his wisdom and his direction. And God is blessing him. But it says, when he became powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. And he sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. And so basically what happens is Uzziah thinks that he's now so powerful 
that, that he can do whatever he wants. And, and so he decides to take on a role in the temple that only the priests were to have. Right? And he violates God's instructions. He violates God's words. Remember, so pride is exalting self above God. Right? Pride is thinking too much of us and too little of God. And so, in pride, Uzziah attempts to do what only the priest could do. And, and I think that pride had probably snuck into his life. I, it probably came in so gradually that he didn't even realize that it had overtaken his life. He was probably unaware. You know, sometimes we, we're in situations where we just, we just know that we need God's help. We, we talked about our weaknesses yesterday, but just in general, how many of you say that there's been moments in my life where, whether it's right before an audition or right before a test in school or when I was facing something difficult in my life and home, family, wherever it might be, that you just knew, like, I, I, I ask God for help. Anybody? All right. How many of you sometimes in those situations, though, maybe it was for an audition, for an exam, and, and you asked God for help, and then it went really well, and then you thought, wow, I did a great job. Anybody like that? You ever notice that? That sometimes we're like, God, if you don't help me, I can't do this. God, if you don't, I, I need you. And then we do it, and we're like, ha, ah, I did it. Pretty good. You see, sometimes we, we are so good about asking God for help, but then we don't realize that we should give Him honor and credit. So look at verse 17. God is gracious. right? God is so gracious that even when Uzziah does something that he should not have done, and even when pride takes over, God sends him a warning. In fact, He's going to send him 81 preachers. All right? 81 chapel speakers. 81 priests. It says, Azariah the high priest went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. And they confronted King Uzziah. And they said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. For that is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron, who are set apart for this work. Get out of this sanctuary, for you have sinned. And the Lord God will not honor you for this. But Uzziah wouldn't listen. You see, one of the, one of the key symptoms of pride Right? Because, again, it creeps into our life and it's subtle and it sneaks and it lurks and sometimes we don't know it's there. And so, how do we diagnose pride in our life? And one of the surest signs of pride is that when we refuse to listen, when we refuse to listen to God, when we refuse to listen to His Word, when we refuse to listen to the godly people and godly counsel that God's put in our life. Right? God will, God will always seek to communicate with you, right? through His Word, through, through godly counsel and wisdom. And when we don't listen, it's a sure sign of pride. It says in verse 19, Uzziah was holding the incense burner and he became furious. Right? He, he didn't want to hear what they had to say. But listen what happens. But as he was standing there raging, raging at the priests before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. He got angry. He wouldn't listen. And so God intervened. And it says, when Azariah the high priest and all the other priests saw the leprosy, they rushed him out. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. And so King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. And he lived in isolation in a separate house. For he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. And his son Jotham was put in charge of the royal palace. And he governed the people of the land. And the rest of the events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. And when Uzziah died, he was buried with his ancestors. And his grave was in a nearby burial field belonging to the kings. For the people said, he had leprosy. And his son Jotham became the next king. What a sad ending to a glorious life. All these amazing accomplishments, all the things that God privileged him to do and enabled him to do, and yet on his tombstone it said he had leprosy. A sad ending. You see, pride is, has the power to destroy our lives. Right? Pride has the power to destroy our lives. And when we are unaware of it and we don't address it, it has the power to to destroy our lives. My heart, my passion, my desire for you is that you would be God seekers. Right? That, that in this amazing relationship that God has offered to you through Jesus Christ, that you would have a heart to seek Him and to know Him and to seek His presence. And if we don't have humility in our life, 
We will never be able to seek after God the way He's called us to. Pride is your greatest barrier to experiencing the presence of God. Pride is your greatest barrier to experiencing the presence of God. It creeps in. It's, I often call it, it's the sin that we don't see until it's too late. And that's why we need to be aware and we need to allow God to search our hearts and we need to be aware that is this an issue? Is this creeping into my life? And I want to let God address it before it destroys me because pride is a devastating sin. It's really the root cause we set of all our rebellion against God. And pride has the power to destroy. And Jim Simbola said this, the pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. He said, the Bible never says that God resists a drunkard, a thief, or even a murderer. But he does resist the proud. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And literally, that word resist, it literally means to stiff arm someone. All right? I, I'm a big football fan. All right? Unfortunately, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan by birth. Right? So I've, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing, but it's, it's a sad thing sometimes too. Uh, but maybe this year. Maybe this year. When a running back has the ball in football and he doesn't want to get tackled, he, he tries to stiff arm the, the tackler and he wants to hold him off. And that's the exact picture that, that God paints about what we do when we have pride in our heart to God. We, and, and God does to us. He says he stiff arms us. He holds us at a distance. God resists the proud, but he gives grace. He gives grace to the humble. So how do we diagnose ourselves? We have to ask ourselves some questions questions. Am I, am I listening? Right? Am I listening to God? Am I seeking His voice? Am I seeking His word? Am I seeking to allow His word to shape my life and direct my life? Or am I more interested in doing my own thing? Am I listening to the godly counsel that He puts in my life? Is my heart tender towards God? You might ask yourself this, do I trust my talent more than I do God? Do I trust my intellect more than I do God? Do I think of self more than others? It's been said about pride that pride makes you resentful when corrected, impatient when hindered, critical when speaking of rivals, jealous when seeing others advancing in any way, untruthful when confronted, and distant when slighted. And if those things are true in your life, it's a sure sign that pride is there. And here's the amazing thing, though. I believe God, God wants to intersect our lives before it's too late. Right? God has given us the stories of men like Uzziah to warn us so that we wouldn't have to go down those same pathways, so that we could turn around before it's too late and to humble ourselves before God. One of the things I would encourage you to do is to have a Zechariah in your life. Right? As Uzziah started out with this man named Zechariah who was a godly influence in his life who encouraged him, who loved him, but spoke truth to him and taught him to fear God. And so I would encourage you to, to seek out a mentor in your life, right? Whether it's someone in your church or a teacher or somebody that, that you know, and you just might say, would you, would you, would you mentor me? Would you, I, I want to have someone in my life. Right? And, and hopefully you have godly parents and situations there. Some of you do, some of you don't. But, but someone else also in your life that, that will mentor you and encourage you and be honest with you and confront you if necessary. One of my favorite memories of my time as a camper, and as I told you, uh, Sunday night, it was a century ago, uh, but one of my favorite memories, and I'll be honest, I don't remember a lot of chapel messages from my time as a camper. I remember a couple. But I do remember a night that, in, uh, that my counselor invited uh, Dr. Sam Shu. And you heard about him last night as Dr. Britton shared her testimony uh, as she, he was her teacher. But uh, my counselor invited him to come and, and do devotions with us one night. And I can, think, I can remember the, the room we were in, the building we were in. And, and that night he shared just one verse. It was Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And he said, He has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord does require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And that, that verse that night, I, I, I don't know what it was, but God used him that night to deliver that verse. And not that I've always lived it out the way I should, but that night burned in my mind to do justice, to love kindness, but to walk humbly 
to walk humbly with God. He was a man who was immensely talented, but had an amazing, amazing presence of humility in his life. And I really believe it was that that made what he shared so impactful, because he lived it out. And my desire for you and myself, for all of us, is that we would be people who walk humbly. Right? Realizing our need of God, our dependence on Him, for God to be first in our life. James chapter 4, verse 10 says, To humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. We do such a good job of trying to exalt ourselves, but that's not how God calls you to live. He calls you to humble yourself before Him and let Him exalt you in the way that He chooses and desires. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I, I thank you this morning for your grace in our lives. And Father, I thank you that, that you have given us warnings because you love us. And Father, I pray that we would take seriously the warning of pride. Father, it can sneak into our lives so easily. Father, and, and so many times we don't detect it. And Father, I just pray that, that even in this moment right now, that if there's pride in our hearts, Father, that you would reveal that, that you would expose that, that you would convict us of that, Father, not so that we would feel bad, but so that we would run to you and confess it before you. Father, so that we might once again humble ourselves before you. And Father, I pray that, that you would remind us and put reminders in our life and put people in our life that, that would challenge us and call us to walk humbly before you. Father, I pray that you would do that for your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.